Race, a traditional Semitic approach presented by Dr. Russell Fuller. And uh, Dr. Russell Fuller, if you're not familiar with him, you ought to be. Uh, he got his uh, PhD from Hebrew Union University. And uh, he's a Semiticist and a theologian specializing in biblical languages. He taught for over two decades at Southern Seminary in Louisville. He taught courses in Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, and also uh, Old Testament courses as well. Uh, you want to definitely check out his website online, russelltfuller.com, where he's now offering uh, classes. And uh, he comes highly recommended. If you, want to, if you want to understand Hebrew, he is your go-to guy. And so we're going to turn it over to him in just a moment. But if you have any questions along the way, uh, just put them into the uh, to the question box that's here in GoToMeeting. And uh, if it's a question we can answer, we'll answer. But if it's a question for Dr. Fuller, we'll leave the answer blank and we'll wait and ask him that at the end of the, the session. We also will have a handout available at the end of the session. So uh, he wanted to kind of wait and, uh, and and give that to you after the presentation. So. We'll make that available. And there's also a coupon code for a 25% discount that we're emailing out uh, to everyone who is registered for the class. So, and I already see a question I'm gonna answer real quick. It says, and I'll enter it. It says, please enter the, the URL for Dr. Fuller's website. We will do that, but let me repeat it again. It's russelltfuller.com. Russell has two S's, two L's, and two L's in Fuller. So russelltfuller.com, and we'll put that uh, in there as well in just a moment. All right, Dr. Dr. Fuller, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. It's good to be with you this afternoon. It's uh, where I'm at. I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. It's uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but wherever you are, it's good to have you today. We're going to look at <clears throat> in a, tr a traditional approach to biblical Hebrew. So I'm, uh, I'm old school. I'm a throwback. So what I'm doing is, what I've done is I've gone back and looked at the medieval Jewish grammarians and even the medieval uh, Arab grammarians. And I think we should approach Hebrew from uh, this perspective, like it's been taught for really centuries. In the last 50 to 80 years, there's been a real shift, if you look at a lot of the textbooks and so forth, going to a more modern linguistic approach. But I'm arguing for the traditional approach that was uh, around for, <clears throat> for, again, for centuries, uh, and really for millennia, for that matter. And so th today I'm going to do an a traditional approach to biblical Hebrew. I can't cover all the different places. I, I would need more time than that I can do in this lecture. But I'm basically going to focus on the verbal and nominal clause. And if we have time, I might be able to move on to another topic. But for today, right now, I just want to look at the nominal and verbal clauses. But um, before that, I want to give you sort of my reasons for a traditional approach to Semitic languages. <clears throat> my first point is this. Native speakers are the best at analyzing their language. And believe it or not, that's become a controversial statement. Uh, I was in a um, class where someone who was holding to the, uh, ling the modern linguistic approach said that you cannot trust uh, native speakers to analyze their own language. And uh, <clears throat> I was rather shocked at that. And of course, in the room, we had people from China, we had people from Korea, and I'm sure uh, when they heard that, they had to be scratching their heads. I mean, if you want the, you know, the big, uh, uh, the, the greatest experts on Korean today, <clears throat> of course, you would go to their national university uh, in Seoul, Korea. That's where you would go. If you want the best experts on, <clears throat> excuse me, the Chinese language, you would go to Beijing at their national university there, you see. And so again, native speakers. Now, people who are not native speakers, they can become so good at a language that they can become like a native speaker. But still, native speakers are the best at analyzing their own language. Therefore, medieval and even some modern Jewish grammarians and, um, when I talk about medieval, I'm beginning with Saya Gaon, he's like 10th century AD, who were fluent in Hebrew, Arabic, and Aramaic, were virtual native speakers of biblical Hebrew. <clears throat> It'd be really similar to let's say Elizabethan English to us. Uh, yes, we're not native uh, speakers of Elizabethan English, but yet at the same time, 
with a bit of study, we could be pretty close. We could be very close. And so again, these medieval and even some modern Jewish grammarians, especially if they're fluent like the um, Sephardic grammarians were back in the Middle Ages, they were fluent in Hebrew, Arabic, and Aramaic. And um, these types of people, I'm telling you, they're virtual uh, speakers, uh, native speakers. Classical Arabic and standard literary Arabic are the Latin of Semitic languages. <clears throat> its morphology is often identical to, proto, to the Proto-Semitic language. Its syntax is over 90% similar to Biblical Hebrew. Arabic also has grammarians going back to medieval times. Sibiwahi, for example, uh, goes all the way back to the 8th century, which precedes Sadia Gaon. <clears throat> My claim can be verified. <clears throat> Give an educated Arabic speaker who has never studied Hebrew a half dozen le uh, lessons in Biblical Hebrew so they can turn Biblical Hebrew into Arabic and watch them go. <laughs> I've seen this. Uh, I've been teaching Hebrew for over 25 years. And I've had uh, Arabic speakers, people who are native Arabic speakers. And when I have them, all I have to do is give them a few lessons, show them how to turn it into uh, basically Arabic, <clears throat> and they will get a good 90%. And also what they'll do is sometimes I've given them passages on purpose knowing that's not the same in Arabic. And when they hit it, they'll stop and they're like, wait a minute, that's not what we do. <laughs> and they'll look at it and they'll look at the context. And I mean, every time I've done this to them, they, they figure it out. They're like, oh, I see what they're doing. And then they go on, they just look at the context and, and they go from there. And so, so if you do the same with an educated Westerner who has never studied Hebrew uh, and give him a half dozen uh, lessons in biblical Hebrew, and then you can give him 50 years if you like of modern linguistic theory and watch him flounder because he is not going to be able to do what that Arabic, uh, native Arabic guy can do. Because again, biblical Hebrew, this demonstrates that biblical Hebrew and Arabic, uh, especially classical Arabic or standard literary Arabic, uh, they're very, very similar. And that these guys could, uh, that these uh, Arab speakers can do Hebrew so well. And again, never seen Hebrew before, really never dealt with Hebrew before. Uh, again, really does verify uh, what, I'm, what I'm claiming uh, today. So with that, um, let's, uh, we're gonna talk about two different type clauses. And again, I'm doing this all from a traditional Semitic approach, okay? So first we're gonna talk about the verbal clause. Uh, and a verbal clause places the verb before its agent. And that's the word they use for the subject, the word agent, <clears throat> but they mean subject by it, no problem. So verbal clauses place the verb before its agent. So that's how they define it. Then the verbal clause focus on, on uh, verbal clauses focus on the verb, its development and progress. The verb and its action or its state, remember they have state of verbs. In Semitic, uh, they don't see just uh, what their normal standard verbs or what we would always call action verbs. And they also see states. So to be tall is to them a state, you see, to be heavy. That's a state, but it's also a verb to them. That's foreign to Westerners like ourselves. We're not used to that. Of course, they're not used to our auxiliary verbs or our being verbs. They really don't have a being verb. Their haya is not a being verb. Haya or kana in Arabic, they're not being verbs. They're verbs of existence. And to them, they're a verb just like amar or, you know, shamar, any other verb. Okay, so it's not, they really do not have being verbs. Okay, the closest they have to it is haya, but Again, it's more of a verb of existence. Okay, so the verb and its action or state is more important relative to the agent or the subject. So in other words, if you have a verbal clause, it's the verb, its development, its progress, its action, its state. That's what's being, that's what's more important relative to the subject, okay? So again, we're not saying the subject is not important. The subject is important, obviously. 
but relative to the verb in a verbal clause, in a verbal clause, it's about the verb, okay? The verbal clause is the normal word order in Semitic, and it's the backbone of Hebrew narrative. So when you look at a biblical Hebrew narrative, it's usually going to be verb first, subject second. And again, that's their definition of a verbal clause. Now let's look at nominal clause. Nominal clause is a little more involved here. Nominal clauses are either without a finite verb. So if you just have a sentence with a bunch of nouns, let's say, that's a nominal clause to them. Or you can have a finite verb in a nominal clause, but if you do that, then the initiator or the subject must occur before the announcement, okay? That word order has to be that way. So if you have your subject or what they'll call the agent, and here they'll call, by the way, the initiator, um, because to them, the subject of a nominal clause, they will define that different than a regular verb subject relationship, okay? So again, the subject of a nominal clause is called an initiator to them, which means one that begins, it's, one, it's, a, it's a new beginning to them. So it's got to occur before the verb, and they don't even call the verb of a nominal clause really a verb. They call it an announcement, and we'll get into that in a little more detail. That's how they really separate verbal and nominal clauses. They don't even use the same terms like verb, subject. They switch those. So if we go back again to verbal clause, they'll use the term agent and verb, okay? So agent and verb by Agent, they mean subject. By verb, they mean verb. When they talk about nominal clauses, on the other hand, they even use a different nomenclature. That's how different these things are to them, okay? And so again, if you have a nominal clause without a finite verb, <clears throat> that's obviously a nominal clause. And by the word, the, no the word nominal <clears throat> is just another word for noun, okay? It's really noun clauses to them. And so <clears throat> if it's without a finite verb, it's just nouns. Or if it has a finite verb, again, you will not call it subject and agent uh, to them. You'll call it an initiator. And again, that's the subject of a nominal clause. And it must occur before the announcement, which again, is what we would call the verb. But now they're calling an announcement, all right? So they're different things. The nominal clause describes its noun. So it's about description, okay? It's, it, that's what nominal clauses are about. The verbal clause is about action or the state. Nominal clauses is all about description of its noun, of its nominal, if you please. The noun and its description is more important relative to the verb, if the nominal clause has a verb, of course. <clears throat> now, again, we're not saying the verb is not important, but in a nominal clause, the noun, its description, its development, its characterization, all those things are what's really in focus, okay? So I'm going to talk about now the term initiator. It represents a new start. So when you put a noun first followed by a finite verb or just a noun followed by other nouns to make a sentence, let's say, you're doing a new start for narrative by interrupting the verbal clauses to focus on the noun, the nominal, by making an announcement about his identity, description, or characterization. So it's very different when you're doing verbal clauses. Again, that's the backbone of narrative. That's the way you're normally gonna tell a, an account, historical account in biblical Hebrew. When you put that initiator first, you're stopping it, okay? Wait a minute. And what you're doing is you're starting a new beginning, as it were. Now, that doesn't mean uh, necessarily you're starting a new paragraph or no, but it's just you're interrupting the flow of verbal actions for a new start with an initiator in order to give descriptive information, okay? Because you need that descriptive information so that you'll understand the historical account as it's being given, all right? And so, um, let me just read this again. The initiator represents a new start for narrative by interrupting the verbal clause to focus on the noun by making an announcement, and there's that word announcement, the verb, about his identity, description, and characterization. And of course, it can just mean the predicate as well, the announcement can. 
Now, indirect speech and poetry, the nominal clause often emphasizes the initiator. Okay, so that's a little different. Sometimes in poetry and direct speech, you're not getting, you're still getting description, but you're, you're not, it's not quite the same as a narrative. And so frequently in direct speech and poetry, it can emphasize, okay? The initiator of a nominal clause expresses a contrast, and that contrast is either implicit or explicit, okay? But it's definitely there. And what it's doing is it's um, expressing a contrast with other initiators in the context, okay? So um, that is the definitions of a nominal and verbal clause. And so now <clears throat> let's look at some of these, okay? Let's look at some of these. First, we're gonna start by looking at verbal clauses, okay? So the first verbal clause is just a debear, that's it, okay? It has the, obviously the verb, but it implies the agent at the end of the word. If you think of Hebrew, by the way, like katal t, your verb comes first and then your subject comes second. So if you look at the morphology, if you look at the forms of a verb, it also tells you that Hebrew and really Semitic is a verb first language. So again, you know, katal t, katal ta, you hit the verb first, then you hit your subject. In the third person, it's implied, the he's implied here. Now, I know you say, well, what about the imperfect? Because in the imperfect, you have like an aleph, a yod, tav, nun at the beginning. But what the Arab grammarians and the Semitic grammarians will tell you is, no, those are not true pronouns. And to prove that, they'll look at the third person and say, what is yiktol? What is that yod there? What pronoun? And then you can look at like Syriac, and instead of getting the yod there, you're going to get a noon there, you see. And you can see in like Aramaic, sometimes they'll use a lamed in Arabic. Sometimes they can use a lamed. I think Akkadian's the same way. In other words, the third, uh, the third masculine, if you notice, it'll use different letters sometimes to indicate, and what they call it is, these are substitutes for pronouns. The real pronouns in an imperfect are the endings. So if you say tiktali, and you say, well, how do you know that's the real pronoun? Look at the imperative. In the imperative, you don't have the aleph, tav, yod, nun, to begin the word, what distinguishes it? The real pronouns, they're at the end of the word. You see, so even the Hebrew morphology shows you that it's verb first, subject second. Okay, what they say about those pronouns, going back to those pronouns one more time, they're imperfect indicators. That's what tells, I mean, that's what's telling them oh, we got an imperfect here. Okay, and it's not like a perfect, it's a different. And so they're imperfect indicators and they substitute for pronouns, but they are not pronouns. The pronouns are the endings. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> verbal clause is pretty simple and there's not much controversy about a verbal clause today, thank goodness. And so again, it would de bear, it's uh, literally spoke he, okay? And the he is implied here in this case. This time <clears throat> I have it where we have the subject explicit here. So de bear Moshe, <clears throat> if you notice, in Hebrew, these two words have to be pronounced together. You cannot separate this word. And I'm speaking in general. Now, look, if you say <clears throat> Moses, the servant of the Lord, a servant of the Most High God, or something like that, you start putting a bunch of, uh, of uh, appositions to Moses. Then, yes, in the Bible, you'll separate uh, your agent from your verb. You will. But if it's just a simple verb and subject, no, you won't. You must say Diber Moshe. You cannot say Diber Moshe. Oh, no, 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 no. They can't do that. Notice that even the bear here, see that right there? You would expect that to be a Seire, but they, frequently it's given a Sogol because it's just like it's in construct, really. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like it's closed, unaccented. Hebrew requires a short vowel, and that's what you get instead of the normal seire, and that's what you get most of the time. Now, if you put deber in pause, so if you reverse the word order, put it in pause, you'd get a seire. Uh, there's no question, you'd get a seire. 
But um, <clears throat> again, you must pronounce this de better moshe. Again, you, you, you're not supposed to delay between the pronunciation because that's really part of the meaning, okay? It's the same thing with Arabic as well. You cannot delay uh, as you're pronouncing um, a verbal clause. It's verb and it's agent or it's subject. You must pronounce it basically as one word, all right? And now let's go to the nominal clause, okay? The verbal clause, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Let me just again remind you, your verb must come first, your uh, subject or agent must come second. Now we have something different. We have nominal clauses and now uh, with nouns and the way that traditional Semitic grammarians define nouns, it includes adjectives, it includes participles. So to them, participle is a noun, it is not a verb, okay? Now I know in modern uh, Hebrew, and they would see the participle as a present tense verb, but if you go to biblical Hebrew, uh, again, it's viewed as a noun. Okay, so um, here's a nominal clause with just nouns. And uh, so we have an initiator and the men of Sodom, and then we have the announcement about it. And so, which is your predicate, and it's an adjective here. And so we would say the, uh, the men of Sodom are, were wicked, okay? We would have to add this in. They don't have this right here, uh, but we have to add that in. That's glue, and that's put it together. So uh, this is like A over here, and then you get equals uh, B over here in some way. Okay, that's, that's an ugly B, but there it is, the B right there. So basically, that's what you have. And again, description is the name of the game, all right? You use this for description. And so you're describing the men of Sodom here, okay? Now, here's with the participle. And again, it's another nominal clause. And again, participles are considered nouns. This construction is uniquely Semitic. We cannot do this in Western languages, whether you're talking Latin, Greek, English. Moses is a speaker, one who speaks. Um, if, as, you, uh, as you look at this type of construction uh, in Hebrew, uh, if you look at the Septuagint, you look at the Vulgate or whatever, 99% uh, of the time, they're gonna to have to use a finite verb for this over here, okay? Because again, this is not the way we do it in the Western languages. So this is uniquely uh, Semitic, but Semites, even to this day, what you're talking about on the Arab streets or whatever, this is the way they like to talk right here, okay? But this is a nominal clause. It's highly, as they would say, it's a very efficient way of speaking. It's, it's very descriptive of Moses. That, matter of fact, they'll call this a descriptive noun. It's not just a dead noun, um, okay? Now, even that adjective we looked at just a minute ago, even to, to them, that is a descriptive noun, uh, an adjective. Now, a regular noun, uh, that's different. That's just a dead noun to them. <laughs> that's not descriptive, okay? But this right here, they will say to you, is very efficient. It's um, highly descriptive of Moses here. Plus it implies verbal action, but it's not, this is not a verbal action to them. Okay, that's not verbal action. A perfect, imperfect, and yeah, an imperative, but the perfect and imperfect, an action comes into existence and occurs. And it's either finished or it's in process or about to become in process, things like that. This, no action is coming into um, existence. Remember, this is often used for professions, occupations, okay, the participle is. And so Moses here is like he uh, speaks professionally. I mean, is the way, he, you know, unless this is to, to them. But it implies verbal action, but it's not that. So to them, it's a very efficient way of speaking, and they love to talk this way, okay? But still, this is another form of nominal clause, okay? Here's a nominal clause with just pure nouns, but it's a little more complicated because this is what you would probably call a causes pendens. The Semites have a similar way of describing it, but they call it preoccupation. And I, I like that term. Uh, causes pendens, of course, means hanging case. And what, they're, what we're saying by that is this word is 
painting. It's not the subjects, not the objects, not the verb or anything like that. Here's the real sentence. His, th his throne is in the heavens. There's your sentence. This word right here is just floating, as it were. And so it's given emphasis by doing that. And again, that's causes pendants. Semites describe it pretty similarly, but they'll call it preoccupation. And the reason they use that term is this noun and this uh, pronominal suffix. And of course, the suffix is linking there to our initiator. The, the noun and this pronominal suffix are preoccupied with each other. And therefore, it allows this noun here to hang, okay, to suspend, be suspended, okay? And it's what so it gives it emphasis. But in the way that they would um, diagram the sentence, this word, this initiator, is the initiator of the entire sentence, okay? But the predicate, which is the announcement here, you're making an announcement about the Lord. The predicate here is itself a nominal clause. So the whole thing is a nominal clause, but your predicate is also a nominal clause. So that's how they would see it, okay? And so as for the Lord, his throne is in the heavens, okay? So it's a little more complicated, but it's still a nominal clause with just nouns, okay? If you didn't have his throne here and just say the Lord is in the heavens, again, it'd be a nominal clause. This word would not be in preoccupation or causes pendants if you did that. But once you put that pronoun referring back, now you've created the causes pendants and so forth. So this is a more emphatic. Uh, if you, um, this is more emphatic. OK, you could say something like the throne of the Lord is in the heavens and that'd just be normal. This has got more punch to it, okay? So that's a nominal clause with a bit of um, um, better juice with it, okay? It's got more energy to it, shall we say. Now, let's go to something called what the, what the, uh, the traditional Semitic grammarians call separating pronouns. So this is very similar to the construction we just saw, but now we're adding this pronoun over here. Okay, and the purpose of the separating pronoun, there's a twofold purpose, but the main purpose is so that you will not read this. Let me say it this way. If this word did not exist, you would, uh, it would be a little bit ambiguous how to read it. Do we read this as a statement, a real sentence, or do we read this as apposition? For the Lord, uh, your God, a consuming fire, and then something else, you see. So you could read this as a statement, or you could read this as apposition. When you put the pronoun over here, it makes it very clear that what you have here is a statement, okay? It's not an apposition. And the second thing it can do is give it emphasis, okay? It can give it emphasis. Now, on, on, so here's what you have. For the Lord your God, that's suspended because this pronoun is pre, uh, which goes goes back to the Lord your God here, is being preoccupied with this. Hence, this is suspended here, okay? Given emphasis. So there's real emphasis over here. There's even emphasis here because it occurs before the pronoun. The pronoun has zero emphasis in, in this context here, okay? Zero emphasis. So for the Lord your God, he is a consuming fire, okay? So uh, again, this is really a nominal clause. This is the subject of the entire nominal clause. This is the predicate of the entire nominal clause but yet it is also a nominal clause. So again, you can have a nominal clause as a predicate inside of a larger nominal clause. We're seeing it again here, okay? Let's go to the next one. This is very similar. On this one, you could cut this word and there would be no problems because you cannot read this uh, appositionally, okay? For the judgment belongs to the Lord. You, you cannot read that appositionally. 
The placing of this here is just pure emphasis, but not on the pronoun. Again, it's setting up a causes pendens or preoccupation. This, word, this pronoun, which goes back to here, again, is preoccupied with this word. So this word can hang. You've always got to put your hanging word first, always. Okay, you must put the, you've got to put that first. And again, this makes it much more emphatic. You could have just dropped that who and lost nothing, okay? You would have lost nothing on that. Let me show you uh, an example here in Hebrew. In um, Genesis 41, 26, seven cows are seven years and the seven good ears are seven years, but it's the last part that I'm interested in right here. If you don't have this who there, you could read that one dream. And you would read the achad adjectivally, or really to them, they would read it as appositional, believe it or not. And they'd say, one dream. And so that would be an apposition, you see. But the addition of that right there, that pronoun, lets them know, no, 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 no. The dream, it is one. It's a statement, okay? Now here, um, it's clearly to make sure you don't read this improperly. So the emphasis here is virtually nothing because the whole purpose of this pronoun here is simply just to get you to read it as a statement. You, you really cannot, if you don't have that there, you, you, it's really, it truly is ambiguous of how to read this. But the who here makes it clear it's just a statement. Again, no emphasis, and even though technically speaking, that word is and causes pendants, but with virtually zero emphasis at all, okay? All right, let's move on. Now, you can move the pronoun to the middle. When you do that, that's a different ball game. Now, uh, you still have the same uh, separating pronoun, because if you didn't have this, you definitely could read this, the Lord the God. You could read that as appositional. And that happens in the Bible, you know, seven, eight hundred times easily that uh, the Lord and God are read appositionally. It's it's very rare in Scripture that when you have this combination, and, and I'm not talking about necessarily the article, but just any combination, it's very rare that you have a statement unless you've got the separating pronoun, okay? You, you need that separating pronoun. But it also brings uh, maximum uh, emphasis. M uh, uh, again, this is the word that gets most the emphasis. It's the hanging word. Now the pronoun gets quite a bit of emphasis. This word, not really. This word doesn't really get much emphasis. So uh, as for the Lord, he, and like he alone, is the God. So this makes it really an exclusive type of statement and almost interchangeable too. The God is the Lord. You could you could flip it around basically once you put this who in between. Okay. Now normally you can't flip you can't flip stuff, and you really can't flip it here either, to be honest with you. But uh, this makes it virtually an interchangeable statement, and, and it's exclusive. Okay. It's like the Lord and Him alone is that kind of thing. So again, when you move the separating pronoun in between, high high emphasis. Okay. That's the that's the max you can do on the emphasis right there. So now we want to look at clauses with a finite verb, okay? Now, this again, the first example I'm giving here is the verbal clause. And now this down below is the nominal clause. And if you notice the accent marks, again, you must read this, de better Moshe. This one, and I'm being technical here, of course, Moshe, de bear. And that difference in the way you say that communicates different things to the Semitic ear. Same thing in Arabic, okay? You put that subject first, you're gonna have to pause there a little bit, okay? You've gotta pause there. And that signals in their mind a different meaning. These, the words are the same, no question. The meaning is different to them. So different, again, remember, this is a verb, this is an agent, all right? But to them, this is an initiator. This is an announcement. They use different nomenclature to show you how big of a difference this is to them. I know to us, we would read it and say, well, Moses said, Moses said. <laughs> no, 
uh, not to them. Okay, so let's look at things and um, uh, well, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Let me talk just a little bit before we, maybe before I get, maybe I should do it here. When we deal with a nominal clause, let me give you some analogies that might help you understand what I'm getting at. And, and I'm gonna go in more detail, so don't worry. Let me give you a couple of analogies about uh, verbal versus nominal clauses. So here's an analogy. Suppose you have a guy on a stage and you got a spotlight, okay? And the spotlight's hitting the guy on the stage. And what he's doing is he's, he's hammering an anvil, okay? If you put the spotlight on the anvil and you can see the actual hitting of the anvil and so forth, what do you have? You have a verbal clause, okay? Because the, the spotlight is on the action. It's really, it's, it's really on the, the hammer hitting that anvil. Now, can you see the, the guy doing it? Oh, yeah, 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 he's there, sure. But the spotlight is right here, okay? On the other hand, if you put the spotlight on the man, yeah, you can see he's you know, swinging the hammer and so forth, but the spotlight is over here, uh, that's a nominal clause, okay? So you see the difference. But where is the spotlight? Um, it's here, it's on the action, in the verbal clause. In the nominal clause, it's on your noun, okay? That's where it is. Let me give you one more. You turn on the uh, television to watch a sports event, okay? And usually, it's usually best. If you have two announcers, okay? You've got two announcers. One announcer is called your play-by-play -play man. And what does he do? He describes the action as it's occurring, okay? That's your Al Michaels, if you know who I'm talking about, okay? So the, the kicker kicks the ball, the returner catches the ball, he takes off, he breaks a tackle, and, and he is giving you nothing but verbal clauses, okay? So your play-by-play -play man, he can only speak in one language, and that's the verbal clause. However, when the play is over, and now, you know, there, you need insight into the game. You need description so that you can appreciate the game more, the, some of the subtleties that's going on out there and so forth, okay? <clears throat> what you need is what's called a color man. And again, what do they mean by color man? He gives color to what is, you know, he, he, he descri it's descriptive, you see. He describes what you just saw. Hey, as for that kicker. Do you know he's got a bad knee? And blah, 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 blah. he'll sit there and he'll describe, you know, oh, did you see that block there? As for that block, let me tell you about that block. Notice how, it, see, uh, your John Madden, he speaks in nominal clauses because again, he is not giving you play by play of what's going on. It plays over, but he's giving you some details in order for you to better understand what you just saw. Or sometimes he'll give you detail because he, he knows what's coming. And so he'll give you detail about descriptive details. And then when the play happens, you understand the play better, okay? So um, to me, when I'm reading in the Bible and I see this, it's play by play, man. It's Al Michaels talking there. When you get this, that's description. Uh, that's your play-by-play -play man. He's giving, I mean, excuse me, that's your color man. He's giving descriptions so you'll understand what's going on, okay? He helps you do that. So with that said, let's uh, go on. And now we're going to talk about being two-faced, okay? <laughs> that's what the Semitic grammarians call it, being, having two faces. Let's look at this. Here we go. Moses de Bear. There it is. How do they understand that sentence? This is a nominal clause. Why? Because your initiator precedes your announcement. Okay, that's why it's a nominal clause. Now, how do they how do they break it down? They break it down like this. This is the initiator of the whole sentence. What is your predicate? This word right here. And what is this word right here? A verbal clause. So you can see the two-faced 
the nature of these constructions. The whole thing is nominal. The spotlight is right here. Okay, and so the the announcement is going to be describing uh, Moses in some way. But on the other hand, on the other side of your face, okay, um, your announcement is an actual verbal clause. And I mean, this is the real deal, real deal verbal clause. Okay, so an action really happens and so forth. Okay, uh, so how do they hear it? As for Moses, <clears throat> there's an announcement we need to tell you about him. Namely, he spoke and then whatever, okay? So uh, when we put Moses first, we're stopping the verbal clauses. Now, as for Moses, hold on there and pause. There's an announcement that needs to be made, okay? There's something we got to tell you about him. Well, while he spoke and then whatever, okay? So there we go and let's keep going. Now here, uh, let me go back. Well, I, I wanted to show you one more thing. What is the real subject of Deber here? And the answer is not this word. This is the subject of the entire sentence. And again, remember there could be other words over here. This is the, subject of the entire nominal clause. The subject of the announcement is the implied he here, or else you don't have a verbal clause. See, a verbal clause, it has to assume its subject over here. So as for, so really, this is a causus pendens. This is preoccupation to them. As for Moses, he, it's implied, and the he is preoccupied with this word, this word floats. It's suspended according to the uh, grammarians, the Semitic grammarians. That's the way they see it, yeah, okay? So this is the subject of the entire nominal clause, but the subject of the announcement is the implied he, okay? So here, this shows you even more particular about what I was just saying. Watch this one. As for Shechem, my son, his soul clings or longs for, okay? Notice this is your subject of the entire nominal clause, but yet the predicate is actually a verbal clause. And notice the subject of this verb is not this. It's this. Here it's explicit. And again, this word is really landing on that word right there. Okay. And this word is preoccupied with that word, so this word can hang. As for Shechem, my son, there's an announcement that needs to be made. You need to know something about him. Namely, his soul longs for your daughter Dinah and so forth. Okay. So there you go. All right. Here's another one. And again, it's considered two faced because, again, you've got really nominal and a verbal clause all wrapped into one on these. OK, so a Semite's going to feel both of those. They're going to feel both the nominal nature of the whole thing, but also from here on the verbal nature of the whole thing. OK, two face. All right. So uh, this is in uh, Genesis 37, uh, three. And we're going to look at it in a little a detail in just a second. Uh, and as for Israel, well, while we've got an announcement to make about him, there's something you've got to know. If, as we move on in the, the account, you got to know something about him. Well, he loved uh, his, uh, his youngest son more than the rest of his brothers. That's what it's going to say. All right. But we can reverse this. And now what do you have? You have a verbal clause now. Okay. Then Israel loved. Okay, that's that's it. There's no announcement. No. Then Israel loved her, and Israel loved. Okay. So let's go. Let's do some test driving now. Um, if we look at Genesis 37:1. Uh, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had soldiered in the land of Canaan. Nice verbal clause beginning your uh, account. Okay. There's really a uh, big break. 
uh, from what's, so this is a new thing. Now you don't have to start it with a nominal clause. You don't have to, you can if you want, but you can also start with verbal clauses. It doesn't matter. But this is, this starts the play-by-play uh, -play -play, man. This is, this is Al Michaels talking here. You never knew Moses was really Al Michaels. So there you go. Then notice early on in account, you're going to get plenty of nominal clauses because th there's certain details you've got to understand or you won't quite catch the story. So here we go. These are the generations of Jacob, meaning his offspring. Okay, so now instead of Jacob being the main guy, and he's still going to be here, instead of him, it's going to be his sons and particularly Joseph. They're now going to be the, the top guys. Joseph, son of 17 years old, not was a sh was shepherding in the sense of a paraphrastic. No, 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 no. This is not was. He existed in the status of one who shepherds uh, with his brothers among the flock. Now he, and again, this is all nominal clauses, you see, and he uh, was a lad. So he's a young guy, okay? And notice who he's with. He's with the uh, sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. These are the guys on the bottom, okay? These are the children of the handmaids. And Joseph's at the top. He's the favorite. He comes from the favorite wife, you see. So he's younger than these guys, but yet he's preferred over them. So these are the guys who are particularly not going to like Joseph. That's what that's basically telling you. Then you get a verbal clause. Then Joseph brought an evil report to their father. Okay, so again, that's Al Michael. Now, everything else before that was color man. Okay, you have to, those announcements you needed to know so that you're understanding what's going on here. And then when you hit this verse right here, if you do this, if you flip it around, then it's like, and then uh, Israel loved his you know, son or something. And you're like, that's weird. <laughs> because you mean after he ratted out his brothers, that's when he started loving Joseph? Before that, he didn't like Joseph apparently. <laughs> But once Joseph told on his brothers, then Israel loved you know, Joseph more than all his brothers. No, 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 no. You get a nominal clause. So you get, um, you get this. And so what is this? Now, as for Israel, notice that juicy revia there. You've got to pause. So watch the accents, by the way. If you come tomorrow, same time, same bat channel and all that, I'm going to talk about how the accents also show you the same thing that the, that the Semitic grammarians talk about. I'll show you how the accents act differently with nominal clauses as verbal clauses. Of course, they have to, because this is a different meaning. If you switch those two around, you would not have a revia there, not a chance. You would have a conjunctive accent, you see. But as for Israel, okay, there's an announcement. You've got to know something about what's going on. Yeah, you've got him telling on people. He's a young guy. He's with older brothers who don't really care for him. You can already tell that. But there's another problem that you've got to understand before you're going to understand the account as it keeps going. Now, as for Israel, here's the announcement. You've got to know about him. He loved Joseph more than all his brothers. For the son of an old age, he was to him, and he made for him a you know, tunic of many colors. Then, now here comes Al Michaels again. Then his brother Saul, da -da 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 -da, and here we go again. But see, you have to understand this as an announcement. Uh, if you flip it around, again, it sounds as if, okay, Joseph told on him, and now he loved him. Didn't love him before, loves him now. Now, let me tell you, if it was actually flipped around, you would find a way to make it work because that's so bad that you would. Well, no, it doesn't mean right after that, uh, but it's very strange Hebrew to do something like that. OK, very strange Hebrew. All right. And so let's do a little more test driving now. Let's go to uh, uh, Samuel here for Samuel 3 1. And we'll do a few verses. <clears throat> and then if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer them. So. Again, notice this um, three one. It, it's we're shifting to a different topic. So 
Could you use a verbal clause? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But you could also use a nominal clause, and they often do, and here it is. And so, and the lad Samuel. So I already have an initiator, okay? You have a nominal clause, so we've got to describe him. And obviously, as I told you, when you have a nominal clause, there's always a contrast, uh, explicit or explicit. Here, it's really explicit, and it's, he's being contrasted with the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. They're wicked. God is going to tell you God's not even uh, sending visions anymore because of their wickedness and so forth. But before we really understand the what's going to happen in uh, the Lord appearing to Samuel, there's certain things we got to know. And so let's we'll watch and see. Here we go. So um, the lad Samuel was one who ministers. Again, we cannot do this in English. OK, see how we have to do a finite verb. <laughs> That's not a finite verb to them. That's a participle. And again, if you go to the Targums, if you go to the Peshitta, they're going to have no problems. Those are Semitic translations, interpretations. They're going to give you that. You go to the Vulgate, you go to the uh, Septuagint, they're going to have to do what we do in English. They're going to have to turn that into a finite verb, but that's no finite verb. Again, this is not uh, causes pendants here at all. OK, uh, this is just a regular old nominal clause, plain, simple. OK. Um, so anyway, uh, but it's still an announcement and there's still contrast implied. As for uh, the lad Samuel, uh, I shouldn't say it that way. And, and the lad Samuel, um, and we have to add was, that's just English. A minister, a one who ministers um, before to the Lord before Eli. And then we've got another nominal clause. And as for the word of the Lord, we've got to tell you something very important. We've got to give you an announcement about the word of the Lord so you'll understand what's going on. It existed in the status of rare in those days. And what do you mean by that? There was no vision spread abroad. God had turned off um, giving revelation and, and judgment and punishment for their sinfulness. He wasn't revealing himself uh, at Shiloh. And so, again, we have to understand these things um, because at the end of the story, of course, and we, we won't get totally to the end, but at the end of the story, uh, God once again is starting to give dreams and revelations to Samuel. And so the word of the Lord is being restored at the end of this chapter, of course. And it happened, verbal clause, and that's a real verb. That's not just you know, a, a being verb linking something together. No, it happened. Yeah, it happened. That's a real verb to them, you see. And it happened on that day. But wait a minute. <laughs> Before we continue with this story here, now as for Eli, something else I got to tell you. We forgot a few things. And so I got something else to tell you here. So notice how the story uh, starts here, but then immediately, hope. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, hold on. Another announcement is necessary. Now, uh, now Eli, uh, again, was like a liar downer, okay? One who lies down in his um, place. Now, again, notice all these participles, descriptive nouns are highly descriptive. That's what you're doing with these nominal clauses. That's what a nominal clause does. It's descriptive, remember? And so using participles is ideal for nominal clause, especially if you want maximum description. And that's what he wants here, our author. And so as for Eli, he was a liar downer, literally. <laughs> uh, again, that's terrible English, I know. Uh, in his place and about his eyes. Uh, there's something we got to tell you about his eyes. We got an announcement coming up. His eyes, uh, they begun to become dim. So probably had cataracts or something like that. He was unable to see. And so, okay, we need to know this guy's virtually blind. We need to know that uh, Eli is lying down uh, in his place where he normally lies down. Okay, we got to know that. So when the story, again, gets moving, we'll be there. And guess what? More nominal clauses. And the lamp of God, um, there's an announcement to be made about that as well. Before it had gone out, 
And if you come tomorrow, we'll discuss this. Look at the translation of the New American Standard over here. And it's not just the New American Standard. Almost every modern translation I know does what they do here. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Really? Uh, Samuel lies down in the holy place? He beds down in the holy of holies or the holy place? No. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a, no, 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 no. No, no. Uh, I don't have time to go into it today, but we will tomorrow. If you look at the Masoretic accents, the, these words right here, Samuel was lying down. Again, nominal clause, descriptive, and so forth. It's parenthetical. I'll show you that tomorrow. So take these words out, and you'll get the real verse, and then we can throw it back in, okay? Now, the lamp of God, there's an announcement to make, is not yet gone out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Now, there's your, that's the sentence right there, you see. This is parenthetical. Now, Samuel was lying down. Not he was Samuel's not lying down in the holy place or the most holy place. No, no. Okay, but now that we know all those descriptive things from the nominal clauses, he was he was just about to start it right here. But again, he needed he remembered more stuff to give. But here we go. Then the Lord called. Now you're going to go verbal clause, verbal clause. So watch, and then you'll get. So of course, you'll get some. Uh, um, direct speech thrown into, okay? Then the Lord called to Samuel, and, and he said, here am I. And he, um, uh, he ran to Eli, and he said, here am I, for you called to me. And he says, I didn't call to you. Re return, lie down. And he went, and he lay down. Verb, 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 you see. Uh, there you go, and it keeps going. And the Lord added uh, to call again to Samuel. And uh, Samuel rose up and he went to uh, Eli and he said, here I am, for you called to me. And he said, I did not call you, my son. Uh, return, lie down. Well, you see what's going on. And we need some help here. What is going on? Now, as for Samuel, <laughs> hold it, hold everything. We need, to we need an announcement here so that the reader knows what's going on. OK, as for Samuel, there is an announcement that needs to be made. There is some description about him so that you know what's going on. He did not yet know the Lord. Now, what does that mean? The very words are used in the preceding chapter to refer to the sons of Eli. And when it says they didn't know the Lord, it means they were lost. But what does it mean in this context? Keep reading. For the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Ah, that's what it means. Not that he was lost. No, but that God had never revealed himself to him before. And so Samuel didn't know what was going on. We need that. Now we know what's going on. And Eli's about to figure it out himself, okay, without a nominal clause, believe it or not. He's going to finally figure it out. But right now, notice how our author wants us to have this information. So he stops everything. Hold it. A new beginning. As for Samuel, uh, let me tell you what's going on here. Okay. But now we resume. Here we go. And the Lord added to call to Samuel for a third time. And he rose up and he went to Eli and he said, here am I, for you called me. Then Eli knew that the Lord was a caller to the lad, you see. Again, notice the nice uh, nominal clause being highly descriptive of the Lord here. It implies verbal action. It clearly verbal actions happen. And once you do the verbal action, now you can call yourself a Kore, you see. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, that works really good. And again, as we keep going, and we'll probably cut it off right here, uh, again, verbal clause after verbal clause, but you'll get an occasional uh, nominal clause in there again to do this. All right. Um, we can do one of two things at this point. I could tell you about the Hebrew verbal system and how it's viewed, again, by traditional uh, uh, grammarians. Or we could go ahead and start taking questions. What is the will of, of the folks out there? I could probably do the verbal. I'll tell you what. Let me try to do the verbal clause. I mean, not the verbal clause. 
the verbal system in 10 minutes. Okay, let's see if I can pull it off. And then that'll give you 20 minutes to, and by the way, uh, you're going to get my email so you can communicate to me uh, after this uh, lecture. And I'll be more than happy to talk to you about any, if we have to, we'll call, we'll talk to each other on the phone if we need to. Okay. So here's the verbal system. And I'm going to do this very quickly. So watch fast here. <laughs> Um, notice we have to call here, then we have the PL, PUL, HIFPIL, they're the intensives. Then we have the HIFIL and the HOFAL, they're the causatives, and then the NIFAL is a reflexive slash passive, okay? Notice the way I have this set up, A, B, A, B, H, and then underneath you can see there's X's, small X's, and then asterisks, okay? The first letter here is for Arabic. Okay, the A here is for Arabic. Arabic has everything. Okay, that's again one of the things that makes it so valuable. So the the active call and also the state of call. They have that. They have the passive call. They have the reflexive call. They've got all your intensives, whether it's the active, passive, reflexive. They got the causative, whether it's the active, passive, reflexive, and they've got the nifal as well, seventh stem to them. And they don't use that term seven stem. That's uh, more Western, but that's what it is. Then you've got biblical Aramaic. And now biblical Aramaic uh, right, is the middle uh, marks that I have here. They have the active, they have the passive, they have the reflexive. Uh, let me just say this about uh, biblical Aramaic. As you get later in Aramaic, it's going to lose its passive and the reflexive will take its place. So it'll be a reflexive passive in later Aramaic, but in biblical period, it's, it's clearly there. They have all the um, intensives, but again, the passive will eventually go away uh, in later Aramaic. And then you have the causatives, and again, it's all there as well. What it's lacking is the nifal. It doesn't have the nifal. Now, there's th those who believe that in inscriptions that they have found uh, Ara uh, Aramaic nifals, and I wouldn't doubt it because the nifal is going to have to be in the uh, Proto-Semitic uh, language, you know, the, the Proto-Semitic language. But probably with all these other reflexives, they, they just dropped it out. Uh, but uh, I think at one time it probably did have it, but in the... Um, uh, biblical period and later no it does not have it now hebrew that's what we more want to focus on but if you look at the hebrew yeah it's got the actives the statives and all this a little bit of passive you know, it's got the passive participle that's not really a verb though as you know it's a noun um but there's but there are some cal passives but they're few okay no reflexive no reflexive okay it doesn't have that hebrew does have everything in the intensives and it does have the reflex of the so-called hishtafel that people you know know about. That really is the ref, uh, reflexive uh, causative. So we have a few examples of that in biblical Hebrew, but not many. Okay, and of course biblical Hebrew has the nifal. Now, a couple things. When it comes to the statives. Again, it's a, it's, it's a verb that expresses a state, which is very foreign to our ears. We, we don't do this. And originally, it's broken down both in classical Arabic and in Hebrew and in Aramaic. But if you really look at it, it still pretty much follows this pattern I'm about to tell you. Okay. Remember, there's two kinds. There's one with the seire, like this one here, and then the one with the holum. What's the difference? And according to, and again, it really does work out, I believe. If you look at it, the seire represents temporary or acquired states, okay? So to be old, you acquire age, you see. Guilty, you see. You weren't, well, you, we are theologically born guilty. I'll, I'll have to say that. But that's, <laughs> we're not talking about theology here. Um, uh, fat, uh, sick. Sick will have the stay rays and so forth a lot of times. The ailments, to be clean, unclean. They're temporary or acquired. You get the holums, on the other hand, those are permanent or innate states, okay? So if you're small, 
uh, we're not talking about little children now. If you're small, uh, that's it. You're, you were born that way, and that's the way you're going to be. And if you'll run this down, you'll find some exceptions. But by and large, uh, that still holds together pretty well. Okay, that still holds together pretty well. Now, let me talk about the passive and the reflexive for a second. Okay, the passive and the reflexive. Well, maybe before I do that, let me do this. If you notice, Hebrew is losing this. It's got a few examples, but it's losing it. Doesn't have this. Okay. And really, it's pretty much done with this. All right. Well, what happens? Yeah, this is what happens. The nifal seems to be taking over in these areas where Hebrew is losing the passive. The nifal is coming over and functioning as a call passive. Reflexive, same thing. Nifal is coming over here and functioning like a call reflexive. Even here, if you'll check the dictionary, notice how many words in Hebrew just occur in the hifil and the nifal. Quite a few of them. And I think what's going on is the nifal is making inroads right here. You see, it's this this form for whatever reason we don't know is dying out, and the nifal's taking over. It's probably not giving you the causative nature, nature, but it's certainly giving you the reflexive nature of it. You see, and so um, the nifal is being much more. It, it's much more, uh, shall we say, uh, flexible, okay, much more flexible. It's being used uh, to take over other pla uh, places where for the call passive, call reflexive is going weak, and perhaps even here in the HIFIL as well. You could even, or, you know, even the uh, Hebrew HIFPIL looks like it might be doing something over here as well sometimes. But again, that's a that's another issue. Now, let me talk about the difference between passive and reflexive quickly, okay? To them, and the active is not a problem. Yeah, we know what an active is, but a passive to them, when they use a passive, it's, it's, it's not like us when we write poorly and we write in all passives and stuff. <laughs> no, 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 no. When they use a passive, they mean to write in a passive, okay? It's usually to hide the agent or the subject for some reason, okay? Because, it, 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 but anyway, there's different reasons. I don't wanna get into that. But when you do a passive, so if you say the vase, or the, say the jar was broken, when you use that in Semitic, it implies by someone, okay? It implies an agent, but it hides the agent. When you do the reflexive, on the other hand, it has the idea of um, the jar got itself broken. In other words, there is true reflexiveness. In other words, the action somehow is coming back on the agent, but it does not imply an agent, okay? There's no implication of who that agent is. Um, now the context may tell you who the agent is. That's that's not a problem. Okay, context can tell you who the agent is, but reflexive is normally used when again you don't care at all about the agent, and the action somehow comes back on the agent, even though again you don't care you know what it is. If you read the Arab grammarians, um, when they describe what a true reflexive is. They'll use these examples, not out of Jeremiah, of course, but they'll use examples, I'm not kidding you, identical to this what I'm giving you. Jeremiah is almost like a grammarian, the way he's doing it. He's, he's teaching us what a reflexive is all about here. You chastise me. Okay, so you've been chastised. Now you can turn it around and put it in a reflexive and you make a perfect reflexive. That's the way they view it, okay? So you're like the object of this verb. So this, this, this action occurred to you. Now I got myself chastised. To them, this is an ideal reflexive. Also, one more thing about the reflexive. To them, a good reflexive is something that what they'll say is, 
perceptible to the senses, something you can actually see happening. And I'll give you examples of this, okay? Now, let me tell you this. Over time, there's no doubt, as you can see in Aramaic, and in Hebrew too, the reflexive and the passive, the, the, the difference is so subtle sometimes between them that they start to come together, okay? They do, they start to come together. But Jeremiah does this all the time. I get all these from Jeremiah. He does it time and time again. Heal me, O Lord, in order that I might get myself healed. I mean, that, again, that is a, that's exactly how the Arab grammarians, and not just the Arab grammarians, but a guy like Sadia Gaon, this is exactly how you describe it to you. Uh, save me that I might get myself saved. And then I will build you and you will get yourself built. Now, this is in Genesis, this is very close. This is in Genesis 37, uh, 35. Um, they rose up to comfort him, but he refused to allow himself to get comforted, you see. Again, that's an ideal. Now, with the Hithpael, it gives you that personal interest. That T there is different a little bit. It gives you a little, just a slight different nuance from the Nifal. That T again, gives you that sort of personal interest is involved there, okay? As opposed to the nifal, which doesn't necessarily give you that, okay? Quite like the hithpael does, okay? That T there. Um, uh, again, personal interest for that. Let me see, do I have any more there? Okay, so let me give you a summary real quick. So the active, he broke it, okay? And the passive, it was broken. By someone or something, agency is implied, though the agency may be unknown. Okay, context could tell you what it is. That's not. A, we'll talk about a divine passive. Yeah, uh, we know who it is, but but uh, the passive itself is hiding it, even though the context may not be hiding it. Okay, and then the reflexive. It got itself broken. Uh, it broke. It broke by itself. And agency is irrelevant. So to give you one more example of this, <clears throat> you know, uh, when I'd come home and I had little children, I knew by which one they chose who was guilty. The guilty person always used this one. You know, the jar got itself broke, Dad. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So if they use a Semitic reflexive on me, I know who to get on to. If it was this one, they just didn't want to rat out their friend, you know, but usually they wanted to rat out their friend. <laughs> that was different, but they'd use the passive. And then that's what mom would do. Mom would tell me who did it, you see. So this is, again, uh, how these things work. And one more thing real quick. Let me show you uh, some ideal, uh, an ideal reflexive. Let me show you here. I hope I got one here for you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to skip the, by the way, the intensives, they're not all in, real intensive, but some are real intensive, but we can't get into that. that. As you know, that's a huge controversy out there, but shouldn't be. Uh, where is my stuff? Okay, here we go. This is, again, an ideal reflexive. Let me show you. And it happened as he finished to speak these words, talking about Moses, of course, uh, Korah's rebellion. Then the earth which was under them, got itself split. See, this is perceptible to the senses. You can see the splitting of the earth going on, you see. Per, at that, let me tell you, that is an ideal reflexive nifal right there. Agency doesn't matter, but we know in the context who's doing this. It's, it's the Lord. He's the one who's splitting the ground, and they're going down. But notice that right there. It doesn't say God split. It could. It could use a passive. The earth was split by someone, and we know who that someone would be. But this is perceptible to the uh, senses. The earth, got, which was under them, got itself split. That's a reflexive. Now, in Hebrew, over time, when you don't have, and in biblical Aramaic, when you don't have words, well, in later Aramaic, I should say, when you have words that are not perceptible by the senses, so mental, things you know, like love, to think, all those kinds of words. When you see those in the Nephal, they're passives. That's where, um, and again, the, the Arab grammarians lament. That's not the way, way to use it because it's going on in Arabic as well. 
but they recognize this this is that's what the language is doing and they can't uh, stop it you see but to them it's like oh it's becoming passive and they don't like it but it happens look in genesis here and the lord said let the waters get themselves gathered again you can see it it's perceptible to the senses and then you come down here the dry land got itself seen okay again perceptible to the senses well i went a little bit over on that but now i am ready to take uh if you have uh, any questions i'm sorry i went too long but uh yeah, we have questions? a few, Dr. Fuller. Okay. Uh, we've got a few, and I think perhaps the first one we ought to address is what email would you prefer if people want to contact you, especially about some of your classes? Yeah, let's do uh, RTF, which is like Russell Thomas Fuller, RTF, and then after that put Fuller, so there's two Fs, so R-T-F-F-U-L-L-E-R -L -L -E at gmail.com. Okay. Great. Uh, Rick, All right. Rick, well, the are first... you put that into the uh, chat area for people? Well, I tell you what, if someone can do that for me, since I I don't know if I can I can ask questions and type at the same okay. time. Actually, uh, it, it so... was in there. Some it was already in there, but those question about the two Fs together. Oh, let me let me say one more thing real quick about the PDF that you have. A couple of the two of the slides I had to I, I forgot to put them in. So they're not in there. That's the definition of nominal, nominal and verbal clause. If you like, I could probably have it corrected sometime later on. There's some other things I got to do when I get off it. By tomorrow, I could um, send it to someone and they could send it out to everybody again. If, if that's, you know, whatever y'all want to do. Okay. Maybe it's too late. I hope not. But anyway. Dr. Fuller, since you are teaching a class tomorrow, we could also make it available in that class. Oh, okay. Very good. That's a good Very idea. All right. Uh, this this next question, I think I could probably at least partially answer this. Okay. But what grammars, first, second, and third year, would you recommend? Well, uh, since I wrote grammars for the first, second, third semester, uh, <laughs> uh, if I go into my own that work, I'm in big trouble here today. You know, I published um, uh, uh, invitation to biblical Hebrew. Uh, both the textbook and the workbook. You can get it through Kriegel and then Invitation to Biblical Hebrew Syntax. And then that book is where you'll get what I'm talking about today, okay? The traditional approach. I was giving you more syntax today. Um, one of the things, you know, I was trained at a, a Jewish school and I was fortunate enough to have a Sephardic Jew fluent in Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, and I mean fluent in all of, in, in many more languages than that. And uh, again, he taught me the old school stuff, and uh, I think he's dead on. I think he is 100% dead on. But let, right. me say this um, to you. let me say one more thing about sure. that. Hold on. If the modern views that are overturning the traditional views are correct, do you realize what that implies? That implies that either the Jews haven't understood their language ever, or they haven't fully understood their language for all these years. That's just incredible to me, okay? It's incredible. Uh, and, and let me say a word about your grammars for everyone. We were hoping to have those grammars available in accordance by this session, and there's been some kind of mix up. I don't mean to throw the publisher under the bus, but we can't, they, they can't exactly find the right files that we need. So. We haven't given up on this, but hopefully, hopefully, uh, sometime in 2021, we can have Dr. Fuller's grammars available in accordance. Yeah, I'm teaching. Um, so, if, yeah, I'm teaching. You know, next semester after that semester, next semester is over. I am going to spend quite a bit of time to try to get them some updated files because we did re do some of the retyping of my first and second grammar to put it into um, type of Unicode font that you guys need and we'll finish it up and hopefully get it to them and uh, so everything can can go on but we, we need to do so, so a little bit more work and um, we should have it on accordance hopefully pretty soon um, i'm going to work very hard to do great. that great all right uh we had a question here when i took biblical hebrew we were encouraged to use walt key o'connor as a reference grammar uh Gesenius as a close second are those congruent with the position you are articulating here 
N not uh, Walkie O'Connor, no. Walkie O'Connor, no. Uh, very different, okay? For instance, Walkie O'Connor uh, would deny the intensification of the PL, PUL, HISPIL. Now, again, I'm not saying every PL is intensive. That's that's not true. It's just like the, not every HIFIL is causative, you know. Um, but uh, in Arabic, they have the PL as well. And they'll tell you it is, in, it, at times, it is intensive. It's the real deal. And you definitely see it in Hebrew as well. Uh, so no, Walkie O'Connor's grammar would be a real departure from traditional understanding. One other thing about that grammar, he talks about the nifal as being semi-ergative. And when my professor read that, uh, he, he just shook his head because he was a Turk. And Turkish is a real ergative language. And he told me, he goes, I'm telling you, there's not a semi-ergative language in the world. He goes, you're either ergative or you're not. And he goes, Semitic knows nothing of ergativity. That is, and again, there's very few languages that are ergative. And I said, well, what is ergativity? He goes, don't even ask. You wouldn't understand if I told you. <laughs> and he goes, Walkie has no clue what he's talking about on that. And so again, um, no. Now, Jacinius, on the other hand, if you go back to the original Jacinius, oh, yes, uh, the original Jacinius would be with me. The one that you're used to, though, is with Couch. Couch um, started to say, hey, we don't follow these traditional grammarians and so forth. And if you read Jacinius Couch, you'll see he redefines the nominal and verbal clause that I was talking about today. But then he admits, but you know, the old traditional way may be correct after all. <laughs> and then he just keeps going his own way. Of course it's correct. Okay. Let me tell you. The Jews and the Arabs, because I'm telling you, they see it the same. You're you're basically saying the Arabs have never understood Arabic properly, and the Jews have never understood Hebrew properly. It ain't so. All right. Uh, is it correct to infer that some nominal clauses have more have one or more infinite verbs? <sighs> um it's it's possible. I'd have to go and look at that. Uh, but yes, it could be. They could, you could have a initiator and then a verb and then another verb, and it's all within a nominal, overall nominal clause. That could be true. Yes. Okay. Have you noticed that in reference to God, the subject tends to be in the third place, such as in Genesis 1-1? No, I haven't noticed that. That's interesting. I'd have to uh, take a look at that. But no, I have not noticed that. But again, to them, let me just say this. To the traditional grammarians, that's a verbal clause. They don't mind if you put a prepositional phrase before the verb. They don't mind you put an object. I don't care what you put there. Just don't put the subject there. Okay. So uh, Genesis 1.1 is a verbal clause, which to me says I can't buy this notion that Genesis 1-1 is simply a title. No, a real action occurred in Genesis 1-1. God actually created the heavens and the earth. Now, after his first act of creation, it didn't look like it does if you look outside right now. Over six days, God will create it to make it look like it is today. But <clears throat> that's a verbal clause. Action occurred there. That's not a um, title. And I don't even believe it's a summary statement. No, a real verbal action occurred there. That's part of the first day. So Genesis 1-1 is part of day one. Another question here. What do you think of the use of Rashi's work to translate the Hebrew Bible as the Masora Foundation uh, have done in their art scroll editions? Uh, Rashi knew Hebrew very well. He could take me out and destroy me. <laughs> Rashi really knew his Hebrew well, there's no doubt. He, he was a master. Hebrew, Aramaic, and I'll, I'll guarantee you uh, Arabic as well. He knew his stuff. Now, I do disagree with his interpretation of Genesis 1-1, <laughs> but other than that, uh, and I disagree with some of his interpretations, of course, but he was... Um, very impressive. Uh, there's no other word to say it. I doubt there's many people living today 
in Israel, you know, in Israel today, there's some really impressive, um, you know, uh, Hebrew professors and so forth. There's no question, you know, I mean, that, that shouldn't shock anybody. But it'd be, there'd be very few that could really compete with a guy like Rashi, even today. Does a nominal clause always have an initiator? Yes. Okay. Why do you say Lord for Hashem? Adonai is a totally different word. Uh, I, I was following like the Masoretic text, you know, in my readings and even the words I was putting up, I was pretending they're like Masoretic text, okay? <laughs> um, in the Masoretic text, the proper way to read the Tetragrammaton is Adonai. Okay, so that's the, the proper way. If you're reading the Masoretic text, the way that Masoretic text tells you to read it, it's Adonai. That's why I read it that way. By the way, if you look at the New Testament, they never transliterate, um, you know, Yahweh or something like this. They use the word Lord. So you can see they're right. sort of following the same direction there. Is okay. there a Bible that catches these? Is there a Bible that catches these nuances in First, Sin, First Samuel that you were talking about? Uh, you know, that's why you want to learn Hebrew and Greek, because there's, there's certain things when you translate, um, you can't bring over all the nuances because one language into another, you just can't do it completely, perfectly. That's why you want to study Greek and Hebrew if you can. But you, you're just trying to get it over pretty literal but yet you're, you're trying to get the main you know points you're trying to get the main words right and so forth but sometimes like i told you like that uh, if you say you know moshe dover okay um moses is a speaker and we can kind of say that but uh, moses is a cutter let's say <laughs> you know, like cutting a covenant or something See, if I translate that literally into English, my English readers are going to be going, that's the worst translation I ever heard in my life. <laughs> they won't even understand the nuances I'm trying to, to, to communicate. So when you're translating, you're going to have to leave off a lot of the nuances. You really do. Um, but that's why I like the, uh, the traditional guys, because they really tell you where they feel the nuances are. They really lay it out. And uh, that's why I like them so much. What is your view on applying the Slavic and German, I don't know if I'm saying this right, action sart to Hebrew, to the Hebrew verb? Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, I believe that the Hebrew verb, and the way the, the traditional grammarians discuss it, there are three parts of speech to them. There is a noun, which is a word they say with inherent meaning. Then they say the verb, it's another word that has inherent meaning, but it also has time and aspect baked into it. Then you have a particle, and that's something they say does not have inherent meaning. Context has to tell you the meaning of a particle. And so the, the traditional grammarians see a verb as a word that has inherent meaning, but time and aspect is baked into it. All right, so, and by the way, I'll just say this about time and aspect. If you're reading narrative, and this is true of Greek, really, if you look at uh, narrative, when you have the narrator speaking, usually time is stronger than aspect, okay? But when you get into poetry, when you get into direct speech, then your aspect becomes usually stronger than time, all right? So if I'm reading Psalm 23, I'm reading it almost 100% expectual there, okay, as opposed to temporal. Yeah, there's time. It's, it's never, it's all this, zero that. It's never that, okay? Remember, both are baked in, both time and, but if you read like um, Luke in uh, Acts, when he is just narrating, you're going to have mostly aorist, but then if he wants to kind of make it a little more vivid, he'll throw in an imperfect, maybe a present tense. But watch Paul in like chapter 13 of Acts when he gets cranked up preaching the uh, long sermon that you have there. Man, there's tenses going everywhere. And again, the aspect strong there. 
where again, if you just look at a narrator, it's it's more time uh, based. But again, there's a, there's a little aspect there, uh, but that's the difference really in direct speech and in poetry because they're very similar. By the way, direct speech and poetry are very similar in Hebrew. All you have to do is just comb through your Bible, your English Bible, and you'll notice right in the middle of prose, you'll see poetry, and a lot of times it's direct speech because they spoke in poetry to each other. They sure did. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, at least a form of poetry, I should say it that way, maybe. And um, so when they talk uh, in direct speech and when you see poetry, most of the time, not, not every time, um aspect is going to be a little bit stronger than the tense when you just have pure narrative normally your time is and that's the same in greek too that's the same in greek all right well i think we're technically butting up against the edge there's still lots of questions we yeah, can go can much longer more. i'll go longer if you want to if you, if it's up to you. Uh, well, if it's if it's if it's okay with the organ other organizers yeah, it's fine I think, with I think, yes. Uh, yes that's fine me, Another 10, 15 minutes, Rick. Yeah, that's good. Okay, good. Uh, should grammar be objective and free from theological presuppositions? Presuppositions. Grammar itself, yes. But really, grammar works on mostly a verse level, okay? Um, it does, not a verse level, I'm sorry. A clause level, like an independent clause and all these things. Now, we should not do grammar just based on some theological, um, you know, presuppositions and, and force the grammar into it. Again, that's why what I'm teaching, what I was teaching you today is from Arab grammarians. They don't have a theological bone to pick with Hebrew on this, okay? And same with Sadia Gaon. Uh, Sadia, in the way, he, when he put out his first grammar, by the way, it's written in Arabic, Judeo-Arabic, and, and the very terms I would use, he was using the whole works, okay? And again, they weren't, it, it's not, it's, it's not um, theological, it's just pure grammar. Now, once you put all the grammar down on a piece of paper, all right, it's it's got to add up to something. It's not just it's not just grammar. And so as we put it all together, male theology comes in, but it's not affecting the syntax. It's not affecting the morphology and stuff like this. So one of the reasons I like the old school is because to me, they weren't, this is not about theology. And again, I'm getting it from Jews and Arabs here. Okay. So it's not a uh, forcing my theology down uh, on this stuff. But at the same time, once we translate this stuff and we start reading what all this grammar is, it adds up to something theologically, okay? Can we make theology force the grammar? Oh yeah, sure, you know, we can do anything like that. But hopefully we won't do that. But all right, we had one person ask if they could see an example of the Nepal taking over. Well, I, I can't show you an example quite like that. And the reason for that is all I can show you to prove what I'm saying is that the call is losing these things, okay? You don't have, in, in Hebrew, at one time, I'm, I'll almost get, because again, these Proto-Semitic would have it, it was a call reflexive. Well, you don't have a call reflexive, okay? And so the nifal is functioning for that, okay? And that's your reflexive. All right, for the call. So I can't show an example because the call just simply doesn't have the, 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 it's reflexive anymore. And so how do you get sort of a call reflexive notion? Through the NIFL. All right, what about if we ignore the Masoretes vocalization? Could it be read differently than reflexive? Sometimes, yes. Uh, yes, sometimes many times. I'm a Masoretic text guy all the way. So I'm like, uh, uh, my views on this are like the reformers. Well, not the reformers, more like the Puritans, uh, I would say, um, like a John Owen, like the bookstores, the son and the father, and like Orthodox Judaism, 
Okay, uh, so the Masoretic text, to me, the Masoretic text is a unity. If you reject part of it, why don't you reject all of it? Why do you, we, we shouldn't just pick and choose. I'll take the, I'll take the consonants, but not the vowels. I'm like, where did you get those consonants? <laughs> you know, and you got that from the same location you got the vowels, the same location you got the accents, you see. And again, I would look at a verse like um, Romans 3, 2, it talks about, uh, you know, what advantages that you have in every way. First of all, to them were entrusted the oracles of God. Well, how have the Jews uh, been the, in, as were the trustees of the Old Testament? And the answer is the Masoretic text. That's what it is. And so I don't care what translation you have, they'll most always go back to the, uh, the uh, Masoretic text. Uh, what it is now today will modern translators you know change it at will especially the, the accents oh yeah the vowels oh yeah well the consonants too yeah they'll change at will and i disagree with that now you're making up your own text uh and i'd say hey give me the masoretic text and then where you think it's wrong just put it in a footnote somewhere put it in your commentary but leave the text alone and don't make up your own text and so many translations, even conservative ones, do it, and I don't like it. Okay. Do you think there is a relationship between the biblical Hebrew reflexive tense and the Spanish subjunctive? I don't know the Spanish subjunctive, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> but if it's got reflexivity to it on, in, on some level, yes, the, the answer would be that. The key is that reflexiveness to it. it, it the action's got to come back onto the speaker in some way. That's that's pretty much the key right there. Okay. That's why they call it reflexive. Um, Sa'adia Ga'an used the Ben Natali Masoretic text, while Moshe Ben Maimon preferred the Ben Asher. Is there any major difference in vocalization that affects the understanding of the grammar? Not really. It's usually those those fights usually go over uh, very technical things like a method and, and, and things of this nature. But it, it can it can affect the reading of the text in the sense of the pronunciation of the text, but not really changing the meaning of the text that I'm familiar with. Um, remember, they didn't have the Internet, they didn't have telephone. And so but yet, if you read a lot of the medieval guys, they'll say, they'll recognize there's maybe a problem in the text, and they'll go, but whatever Ben Asher reads, that's how, we, that's how we read it. They understood that Ben Asher, whatever his text was, like Maimonides, for instance, it's very much, at least the, the, the main view in Israel today, is that Maimonides, when he was talking about the text for Judaism, was Aleppo. And that's why the, I think we just had something on with Emmanuel Tove. You know, he's, I think he's the man now behind the Bible project. Well, that's based on Aleppo. And that comes from, um, you know, most Jewish scholars. The, the, the main guy was Moshe Gosha Gottstein, who I think really showed without a, without a doubt that the, the Masoretic text, according to Maimonides, was Aleppo. Okay. This person says, I was taught that the third person personal pronoun, particularly used in the middle of a clause, a clause was used as a copula. Is this different from what you are describing? Yes, very much so. Yes, it is not a copula. They don't have copula. Okay. That's, that, that, that's a pronoun. <laughs> okay. That's not a verb. It's a pronoun. You said it right the first time. It's not a copy. It's not a verb. They don't need is, was, were. They don't. Okay. Now, if you're in Greek and uh, I am that I am, are you going to use the being verb? Yeah, because it's the closest thing for people who can read Greek in Western ears. That's the closest you're going to get, you know. Uh, but to them, they have no being verbs, okay? Uh, Arabic doesn't have it. Aramaic doesn't have it. Unless Aramaic is somewhere close to a language, uh, I, I, you know, in other words, not like central Semitic. It's on the periphery and being influenced by another language. But Semitic does not have being verbs or auxiliary verbs like that. No. 
who are the classical grammarians that can be referenced? Well, again, Sada Gaon would be one. Um, uh, the Kempkes, David Kempke is, is one. Uh, um, you can get grammatical comments in Rashi and in uh, Ibn Ben Ezra, Ibn Janah, Ibn Barun. I reference some of these guys, and not all of them, but I reference some of these guys in um, uh, my syntax. Okay. And then there was one work I referenced in my syntax, which if you look at it, it's, it's hard, very hard to get. It's an eight volume set uh, that's published in India of all places. It was done in the late 1800s, which gives a complete survey. It's done in Arabic though, unfortunately. Uh, a complete survey of the, of the medieval Arab grammarians. Okay. And so that's where I get the Arab grammarian stuff from, from that. And it's not easy reading. Let me tell well, it's in English too, but most of it's, it, it's, it, there's a ton of Arabic in there. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to get down. But it is in English. To Would you agree? Of it's in English. Would you agree that Genesis 1-1 is a temporal clause, only the first part of a sentence that ends at Genesis 1-3? Not at all. That's an independent clause. That's not a temporal clause. Okay. Um, yeah. And again, look at all your ancient translations. They, they'll all take it as an independent clause. They're correct. Also, look at the New Testament. Look at John 1-1. You can tell they're not taking that as a temporal clause. Uh, that's an, that is an independent clause. There's nothing there that really signals a temporal clause. What is the difference between Rashi your approach? Disagree, by the way. What is the difference between your approach and Ben Pelt's approach in teaching biblical Hebrew? He was a student of mine, <laughs> but when he when he was writing that thing, he was more under what uh, Van Pelt and who's the other guy? Uh, Van Pelt and somebody else is the author of his books, I think. Uh, yes, the other guy. That. Yes, the other guy that um, that we have it in accordance. Yeah, it, Van Pelt was influenced by the other his co-author. And so that book is written in, in that way, okay? He later became a student, he came to, you know, Southern where I was and he studied Hebrew under me as well. We're different, uh, we're different. And it's, uh, what I'm doing is um, trying to really have you master the morphology, the forms. And what we're doing is, is through the, how Hebrew works. So we try to make it, logical and, and, and as much as possible to take away memorization. Now you're still gonna do a lot of memorization with me. I, I don't want you to think, oh, he's, he's eliminated memorization. No, 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 no. But we can eliminate quite a bit of memorization if we understand the rules and how the sounds work, the phonology. And so I, I really stress that big time. And then in the third semester, I stress something called composition where you actually compose the Hebrew and then you, uh, I just put a piece of English in front of you that you've composed it. Now you're looking at this English and you're speaking that Hebrew to me, you see. That's how we learn syntax. Now, again, on the courses I teach online, there's no formal assignments, no formal test. I won't call on you to embarrass you. I'm doing it a different way. I'm doing it a different way. So um, there, there's no test, but if you wanna do the work, if you're serious about doing it, come on. Well, you know, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do. In what ways does the modern view influence theology? Oh, you know, I can't. I'll tell you the best. Maybe the best example of that is the Shema. Okay, they read the Shema in such a way that it's just like like um, was it Anderson? And his notion of the nominal clause or verbless clause, I think he calls it verbless clause. And Anderson's views there are, to me, uh, not good. And I mean, Arabic's had a nominal clause for centuries, and they've never seen it. This, and it's just like Hebrew. I mean, 100% the same. And um, so the way they interpret um, the uh, Shema is really a way that doesn't really lead to, to monotheism, okay? And they'll, they'll have like, um, um, you know, something like, 
the Lord only, as opposed to the, 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 the Lord is one. That's what it should be. The Lord is one. Or let's say the Lord is our God. The Lord is one, meaning the Lord is the Israeli God. But, you know, there's other gods out there, but he's our God. Now, there, there's others out there, but he's our one and so forth. And again, the way they translate it and understand uh, a verse like that, uh, again, is, I, I think, incorrect. So I take it the traditional way. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay. And by the way, if you go and look in Mark chapter 12, when Jesus and the scribe are talking about that, you'll clearly see that the scribe and Jesus are understanding it in that way. Okay. Not, not the other way. How do we gain access to the original Gesenius text? I only know it in certain libraries uh, that have it. Yeah, but there there are editions. And you might go online and just search, but there are editions of Gesenius before a couch. And what they would say is very close to mine. Now, Juan, the original Juan, which is written in French, He's pretty close. Now, he, he varies from the traditional approach in a few ways. But Juan was, of course, a student of Mayor Lambert in uh, Paris, which is the, 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 the most for, foremost uh, uh, rabbi of the day. Then he went and, uh, of course, he was a classicist first. Then he, he studied with uh, Mayor Lambert. Then he goes to Lebanon, becomes totally fluent in Arabic and so forth. Then he writes his grammar. It's pretty good. That's not Juan Moroka, but the original French Juan. Yeah. Uh, what is your perspective on William's Hebrew syntax? Uh, again, he's influenced by a lot of the modern views. Uh, but I mean, it's handy. It, it's helpful. But uh, a lot of the way he outlines things, I would, again, it goes against the traditional view. Uh, he, he'll reject things like intensity for the PL and so forth. Yeah. All right. Well, we still have lots of questions, but it's probably a good point to call it. That. What I would suggest is for everyone whose question we didn't get to, email Dr. Fuller. And uh, he needs something to do time. over Thanksgiving and Christmas break. Give me some time to get back to you now. <laughs> we probably have about 25 or 30 questions left. Okay. Uh, which, yeah. which is which means that you've really stirred lots of uh, lots of interest in this. That, that's well, a, that's tomorrow, always a good thing to see that many yeah, questions. Tomorrow, just real quick. Tomorrow we're going to look at the accents and how it can help us interpret because the accents are very consistent with again a traditional understanding of the text. And so uh, come back and um, we'll we'll start some more controversies tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs>